We're now live. All right, I'm going to bring somebody in here real quick. One second while we get going. Whoops, key. There we go. <laughs> One second, going live here on Friday. Happy Friday. One second. Let's see if uh, Kiana's coming in. We can figure this out. This is what you learn on technicalities. Sent her the invite. Do, do, do. Okay. Send her the invite again. How's everybody doing again real quick? I see Lale coming in. Nice to see you. Got a few other folks. Happy Friday. Coming to you live on site at one of our deals, multifamily. So I'm actually bringing on Kiana. She's one of our newer mentees into the program. Uh, so she's unable to join. Uh-oh. 4K. Does she have camera problems? If not, I'm going to bring somebody else in. I have to bring Lale in here, get live. Hold on. Let's try it one more time. Let's send that invite again. Oh, she joined. There she is. Oh, hello. <laughs> Sorry. I was on my MacBook. <laughs> oh, the technicalities. Yes. Are, you know, it's all, all about live. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Thank you for Good. having me. Are you in Texas today or are you in Arizona? I'm in Texas today. Okay. In the humidity. <laughs> uh, uh, how hot is it out there right now? I think you're in the, but you guys are having some of the storms and stuff too, right? Yeah, we had the storm morning. So it's only about the 80s right now. So we're pretty lucky. Okay. But it's going to, yeah. There Rainstorm you go. yesterday. <laughs> well, yeah. It's like, I haven't done one of these lives in a while, but I wanted to kind of bring you on as one of the, the newer mentees into the program and kind of talk about what you're learning so far about multifamily. Has it scared you like you may have originally thought, or is it, you know, some of the benefits of what you're kind of learning? I would say it is scary, but it's a good scary because it's just like the next level of real estate investing. So it's like I've had experience in the traditional and having you, your group, your mentorship program has been very valuable for us, um, especially for like having access to you and the community. Um, as you know, like last week we met in person, which was awesome with other mentees. And so just having someone to kind of give us a second pair of eyes because we've already submitted two LOIs since joining your program and just having the second yeah. pair of eyes on our underwriting and everything has just been invaluable. So it's been scary, yeah. but fun. What did you gain um, from going down? Cause we had kind of a, anybody's watching, we had a kind of a pop-up meetup in Tucson because we had a couple of our mentees close on one of their first deals down there, a 10 unit, uh, Hayden and Matt. And so, because Kiana was in Arizona and they were looking at some other deals, mm -hmm. uh, she just, you know, jotted down to Tucson from Phoenix. Tell me a little bit about that and, and kind of what you gained from walking that property. It, it was great to kind of see the value adds that they have done and just the ideas that they're planning to do, some of the challenges that they've had and kind of the um, the in process of the renovations and like the permitting and seeing the finished products. And it was just really nice to kind of see someone that is on our side um, to go through the process and everything. And also just know that from your mentorship is the reason why they got there too. So it was great to kind of like yeah. sound board with them. So it was great. Yeah. And what would you say? Cause you, if you had a little background in wholesaling and flipping as well, you'd mentioned mm -hmm. or, or no, okay. no, just but, traditional, but you're here with, you know, Shane and Cassidy and that group. So kind of you came in as a little mini team into the mentorship. Um, have they had any background in that first or is it all multifamily first thing? All, all multifamily first thing. So we all have our investment properties like the single family homes. Um, Shane has some duplexes, uh, but most of us have just done the traditional investment properties. Okay. And what would you say is the difference between traditional investment, whether that's single family or some other things versus the multifamily? I say the big, biggest difference would just be the creative financing of it and really understanding um, how to fund a deal 
I think is mm -hmm. the biggest challenge and the difference between, because otherwise I feel like it's very similar, like you have the same tennis, same type of tennis, but bigger scales. But I think the creative financing um, has been one of the challenging parts or the differentiators. Yeah, most people don't realize, and I had to get it through my brain when I had started years ago, that raising money and the financing, the loans on a multifamily five plus unit property. So anybody that's kind of watching, understanding what multifamily is, it's anytime you're buying an apartment complex that's five units or more, five units or more, or you're in multifamily. And to finance a property like that is in many ways easier than financing a single family home. It's just, you have to understand how it works. Mm -hmm. And once you understand how it works and how things get structured financially, then you're like, oh my gosh. So I can do unlimited properties and I could have very little of my own money in the deal. <laughs> And the bank's not looking at me, they're looking at the property to get the loan. And it's less about my qualifications and my financials and more about the property's financials and qualifications. Mm -hmm. Then you realize, oh my gosh, I just need to then find a way to get some down payment money. That's really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. And if you can get down payment monies between yourself and OPM, right, mm -hmm. other people's money, then you understand how the whole game is played mm -hmm. and that and I, um, so what would you say to someone who has a roadblock or at least a limiting belief in their mind about raising money? I think if you have a roadblock, you just have to ask questions. Whenever you kind of have something stopping you, it's usually because it's the lack of the unknown or the lack of knowledge. And so it's learning how to ask the right questions and just taking the first steps, like talking to someone, your friend or your family and just like, hey, what are your ideas on this? And then learning how to deal with objections. Um, but I would say usually the roadblock is the lack of knowledge or the fear of it. Yeah, and, and you know, from folks that come in that tend to be like, oh gosh, I, I, I don't know how to raise money, I've never done it, or I don't have friends that have any money, or I can't go to ask anybody, or they literally creating these automatic limiting belief systems in their mind. Mm -hmm. Because if I would have come at that with that similar mentality, um, you, you go nowhere, you don't even start. Um, but what you soon realize is that people with some money, we call it some dry powder. I don't care if that's 25 grand they can invest into something or 50 grand or 100 grand or more. The one thing people know that have some dry powder, some money to invest, is that in order to grow that money, they need to move that money and put it into investments. I don't care if it's stocks, bonds, 401ks, real estate, crypto, I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. They know that sitting it in a savings account earning 0. 0.000, <laughs> maybe even a high yield savings, I don't care, mm -hmm. does nothing for them because it's simply not even beating the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. So they know they need to move that money. They just need a deal to move it into mm -hmm. and someone they trust to move it with. Absolutely. And, and yeah. understanding so the tax you, benefits. Yeah. Oh well, God, yes. <laughs> once people see the tax, once people actually see the tax benefits, it blows their mind because they sit there. I mean, it's the first thing I, first time I did this, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, this is legal. <laughs> I'm like, this is legal because I had a huge taxable gain, like event I was going to have have for that a year, but then we'd also purchased a, a multifamily property and we did this bonus depreciation game, mm -hmm. and when I got that statement, my negative K-1 statement to then pass along to my personal tax returns and wipe all of that gain out mm -hmm. in one year, I sat there going, wait a minute, I can do this over and over and over again? Like it's not just a one-time you know, pony show? Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, yeah, you just need to structure it this way and do it this way. And then every year you can just rinse and repeat. And I was like, this is crazy. Like I don't even understand why it's legal, but it's totally legal. Mm -hmm. And then I understood why. I, and I was like, okay, I get the IRS wants us to move a lot of money in society, which mm -hmm. is why they're giving investors this tax benefit to grow wealth, mm -hmm. knowing so well the IRS is going to get their, their piece of the pie later down the road, later down the Absolutely. road. Um, so what are some of the roadblocks you're facing, even now being in the mentorship, what are some of, kind of the roadblocks you're still facing that we can get you through? I would say since we are finding deals now and analyzing deals, so one of the roadblocks is the financing. Like we're seeing a lot of deals with assumable loans. And so mm -hmm. understanding that um, and what is a good assumable loan versus a bad one and when it when does it matter to get a new loan on it? 
because it can sound right. good getting three percent interest but that doesn't always mean it's good when you're refinancing in the future so it's like understanding sure. that i think is going to be so, very helpful. so talk yeah talk about that real quick uh a good and a bad assumable loan so just so people understand this so in commercial real estate anytime you're buying any commercial real estate with a commercial loan on it those loans can be assumable and that can be very beneficial because especially in this higher interest rate environment you don't need to go get a new loan you can actually assume the loan of the existing borrower owner and buy that property with that debt and they just basically transfer that to you you qualify for it but they transfer it to you and bada bing bada boom so that's what assuming a loan is and there's terms to that but it's highly beneficial sometimes when you can go get a three, four percent interest rate on the assumable loan versus getting a new one at six or seven. So absolutely. Yeah. Shout on that real quick. Say that again, sorry. Yeah, let, talk, talk about that real quick okay. in terms of the, the good and the bad assumables that you're seeing right now. So we, we saw two deals when we were in Phoenix and both were assumable loans. One was a six percent interest rate that was principal or no interest only, but it was a yield maintenance. Um, term and it was due in 2028. The other one now, was yield, yield, yield maintenance. What do you mean by yield maintenance? From my understanding, it is a variable interest rate. So essentially, yeah. um, it's a high prepay penalty. Yeah. If you want it. Correct. For the full term. So that's what that means when they say yield maintenance. When you go to get out of that loan or refinance that loan down the road, there's a high prepayment penalty which sounded like a great opportunity if we look at it on the service level. Um, and then we also had another um, property that was a 3% or more or less um, interest that had a step down pay prepayment right. of 4321, same 2028. But then when we were talking to the lenders, they were like, well, maybe it makes more sense to do uh, a new loan on it because of the refinancing or because of all the other variables that goes into it. So yeah. realizing that the 3% probably didn't make sense because of the loan to value uh, was something that we've learned that. Yeah, they probably had a, whatever that loan is. So let's say, give people a perspective for a minute. Let's say you're the new price you're buying this property at, you're buying this property at $2 million mm -hmm. and the current existing loan on it is a million dollars. Well, well, in order for you to buy that $2 million property, you are assuming this loan of a million dollars. So you need to bring in 50% equity to take it down, mm -hmm. which is fine in theory, but your returns are then less. Plus now you need to raise more money to close on that deal, or you need to bring in a second loan to mm -hmm. bridge the gap, they call it. And that costs more money to do that. So then you look at what they call the blended rate of those two loans and you're like, well, you know, first loans at three, second loans at eight or whatever. Therefore the blended is six and a half. We can go get a new loan all together with better terms at six and a half anyways. So that you're just looking at different options. And that's where the creative financing comes in and <laughs> the learning. Yeah. yeah, and it's just learning how to structure the deals. But here's the thing, and I tell this to everybody, it's not a lack of resources it's always a lack of resourcefulness so people need to stop getting it in their brains oh i can't do that or oh that how can i mm -hmm. right how can i because anything can always be done it's just how can i mm -hmm. so open your mind up to that when you're getting into this and if you're in flipping homes or you're wholesaling homes and those are all great avenues of real estate you may be in the airbnbs mm -hmm. there's just different sectors of real estate investing but at the end of the day if I were you know, going back and kind of repeating the process, I wouldn't wholesale homes. I would flip homes, which we've done, and we still flip homes. And then, because that's a faster transactional process, right? You're buying a home, you're renovating it, and you're selling it typically within a four to five month window. Mm -hmm. So that burn and turns faster. And then you kind of take that money and those profits and position it over here into some multifamily type stuff that's slower growth, but it's longer term and you're getting that generational wealth, the tax benefits and all the stuff that comes along with growing your portfolio into larger assets. And that's kind of the, the gameplay I put in for folks. Airbnbs are, are great too for, for that. I'm not in that business strategy, but there's a, a lot of people I know that are. Are you in any uh, Airbnbs? Yeah, okay. I actually have two. Yeah. And that's why I was so I went to Scottsdale. 
<laughs> yeah, how are those going? Where are they at? And uh, how did you get into them? I got into them a year ago, and it was because I wanted to quit my corporate job at J.P. Morgan. And so finding other ways to build cash flow, I think, is why you would go into Airbnb. It's not so much for the appreciation, but there's still tax benefits. So both of my Airbnbs are in Paradise Valley, a little north of Scottsdale. They're doing great. Um, they their pure purpose is to build cash flow for me, and that's what they're doing. So uh, I like that strategy, but that's also why I want to diversify and go into the multifamily because I think there's a lot of it's the generational wealth that you're talking about and scaling. Yeah. So with the Airbnbs that you have, are they changing any of the ordinances in Scottsdale or Paradise or that most of the ordinances are already in place? Most of it's already in place. The main thing yeah. is just getting the short term rental permit, which is very simple. Um, yeah. Do, uh, do they, are they limiting those or there's still plenty on, on the books? There's plenty on the books, luckily. So it's okay. a very saturated market, but I think yeah. regulations are in the favor for short-term rentals for sure. Um, how did those deals turn out that you toured in Phoenix uh, two weeks ago out there? The multifamily deals. Up. We submitted an LOI for one of them. And yeah. we have been building the relationship with the broker, which has been really good. Um, and he is sending us off market deals too. Um, with the LOI that we did submit to them, we just followed up with them and they mentioned that we should increase our earnest money because okay. um, we did the standard 1%. So that was going to be something that we wanted to ask you about sure. was how much would you actually, how much should you increase the earnest money to stay competitive? Because they mentioned they have, of course, other buyers that are interested. Yeah, I mean, it's, 2% would be probably the max I would go. Okay. Um, there's no reason to do any more than that. Uh, earnest money is earnest money. Mm -hmm. And you're putting in down payments and other things as well. So, and it's all refundable earnest money. So, I mean, I get where they're coming at, but uh, no more than 2%, we should get it done. It should be more about the quality of the person. Can they close? Mm -hmm. Can you perform? What does the financing look like? Uh, where's the money coming from? Meaning, is it a syndicated deal, which means you're raising a lot of the money? That is, how is the financing? If I'm taking a look at two offers, mm -hmm. how is one finance versus the other? Mm -hmm. And what is the track record, right, if any, between the two? And can you leverage track records? if you don't have a lot of track record, because that's what a lot of folks will say in general, gosh, I haven't closed anything, I haven't done anything, how do I get deals? Well, it depends mm -hmm. on the size of deals you're going for, which is why I'd mention when people come into these programs, you know, any gurus out there that are telling you to go get a 50 plus unit apartment deal, <laughs> it's just, if you haven't done it before, mm -hmm. your chances, like I, I joke, but you literally can go break in the White House before you can get that, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, seriously, because yeah. first of all, the brokers aren't going to call you back. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they're going to really want some resume or at least someone on your team to have a resume that they can look at because the broker's not going to say, oh, great, unless he has no other options on the table. He or she has no other options on the table. They're not going to take a newbie offer over somebody else, right? So you need... If you're going after deals like that, you need to have people on your team who've executed at that level, period. That's Absolutely. why if you're, new, if you're new into this and you don't have the team or the structure or track record or a lot of capital or a lot of this or a lot of that in place, and you're just trying to get started, mm -hmm. you need to stay under 50 units. And ideally, the ideal deal size is going to be somewhere right around 15 up to about 30. That is hands down the best little pocket that you can be in for your, your first couple deals. And then you can start graduating up. I would say our team's on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I target everybody at because mm -hmm. you're going to deal with mom and pop brokers who will return your phone calls most of the time. And mm -hmm. they're less sophisticated. The sellers are less sophisticated. You can negotiate the deals a little bit better. You can still get decent financing on them as long as your loan amount is a million dollars or more. And you can go buy your first couple deals uh, in that spot. And listen, they're not going to be home runs. Maybe you get lucky and they are, but they're likely just going to be foothills and like footholds in. 
you get some investors in, you get things moving, you have track record, and then you can leverage that for your big deals that are home runs. So, yeah. No, thank you. No, that's very helpful. Any questions that you have for me, I guess, or maybe people out there watching right now that have interest in multifamily, any questions that you can kind of think that you went through that you'd like to have answered, or maybe that someone else is going through getting into multifamily if they're not in it? Getting into a multifamily, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are in the market right now for tier two market specifically, because I know there's a lot of moving parts in. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are like on tier two markets. Tier tertiary markets outside of the main markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what she means by that is you have what's called MSA is metropolitan statistical areas. And those are the top 75 or top hundred in the United States. And you can look them up on Google outside of those. You have secondary markets outside of these big markets. Um, I would say this, I would not go into a market that was not within 50 to 80 miles of a main MSA. Okay. okay. And the reason why is jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you get into a massive recessionary period, everybody flocks to the jobs. Okay. Cause if the market's tanking and everything's tanking, then people are going to move and or drive into the area. So you need to be within a certain distance of a main hub for job growth. So that way, I mean, if you're buying something in the middle of Texas, like literally mm -hmm. in the middle of Texas in a small town, where you have one main job provider, Walmart, <laughs> right? When the markets tank, mm -hmm. which they always do, you have cycles in real estate and in the world, you're gonna have high vacancy at that property. And then you're gonna have high evictions and high delinquencies and high everything. So you need to be within a driving distance of a large MSA. So that way when markets do shift, people don't necessarily leave your property, they just drive further to the job. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's very helpful. And so I'm curious, so I'm sure you get a lot of deals um, that come across your desk and stuff. So what are some key yep. metrics that you look at to kind of um, cipher through them and so that you know, kind of give it a second pair of eyes? So I'm curious how you kind of look at that. Yeah, so uh, depending on where it's out in the country, we like to do Sunbelt states. Okay. Ideally, that's the lower half of the U.S., mainly because that's where a lot of migration population is happening is in the Southern states right now. Uh, and a lot of growth business wise. So population, business jobs, all those things that kind of drive rents and drive growth. Um, so that's probably number one. I mean, it's not that we're against anything in kind of the Midwest or the Northern Midwest portions of Indiana, right? Ohio, um, you know, Nat in, in Tennessee, um, we're in Missouri right now. Um, and those are kind of the Northern Midwest states. Um, yeah, Ohio's great. Indiana's great. Kentucky's great. Tennessee's great. Missouri's great. So those are kind of Northern kind of Midwest states. Um, the biggest thing is going to be, first thing we're looking at is, is population and job growth, high level metrics. And we want uh, job growth at 2% uh, or more per year growth rate mm -hmm. and population growth at 1% or more per year growth rate. And you can look those up online on some of the data research sites. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, um, we want ideally properties at 150 units or more uh, in the Midwest, right? In the Midwest. Uh, that changes a bit when you get into Phoenix and kind of the, in, in Nevada, because tax rate, taxes and insurance are lower in those states. So you don't need as many units to actually have the property financially benefit. When you get into the Midwest, let's call it Texas, Missouri, Oklahoma, like any of the Midwest states, insurance and taxes, property taxes are higher. So in order to get a property really to have economies of scale and enough meat on the bone and pie for everybody, then 150 unit properties or more are where it's at. Um, and there's ways to structure that. So you can have mentees bring deals to the table that are off market where you couldn't qualify for it. We understand maybe you're newer, but you can be a piece of that puzzle because you're going to get a finder's fee. You can get brought in as a co-general partner into the deal for finding the deal. And you may not even need to have a lot of capital in it, but it's a big 
value to find deals, like mm -hmm. especially good deals. Mm -hmm. And it's a big value to bring people to the table and structure things. So that's a huge value to a partnership. And so partnerships are everything in multifamily, which is, I mean, that is the big reason we started the mentorship. I mean, it wasn't just to go sell mentorships and packages and courses <laughs> and programs, right? There's a lot of gurus doing that, but it is to build a really vibrant community mm -hmm. of well-trained investors who are doing deals, finding deals, and being resourceful around the country, where ultimately at the end of the day, we can partner on deals. Like that is really how we grow, because now we can grow our portfolio. That's how you grow, because you can grow your portfolio and everybody's winning and everybody's getting rich. I mean, that's, I mean, check the box. That, that is where everybody you know, benefits. So uh, I'd say those are the biggest things kind of to start off with. And then mm -hmm. we talked about returns. Mm -hmm. You know, you want deals from a property level to return 14 to 20% a year on your money. So it's somewhere in that pocket zone. It could be 20% or more, that's fine. But 20, 14 to 20% on your money is gonna give a first checkbox. Hey, this thing works. Cash on cash. So these are terms that we talk about. Cash on cash means if I give you 100 grand and I get 8% cash on cash, I'm getting 8,000 a year on that 100 grand in physical. Mm -hmm. property and the tax so i'd say for, and tax benefits the people don't even <laughs> like in the numbers i'm talking about like we don't even we're not even calculating that, yeah. right because that's kind of the, the, that's kind of the secret benefit or the mm -hmm. that you know people get when you invest in real estate and when you understand it's not about how, how much you make it's a, how, how much you keep mm -hmm. right Absolutely. it's not what you make it's what you keep yeah and when people see the tax benefits it blows their mind. I mean, they're just like, I, I don't understand. I'm like, what do you don't understand? They're like, I don't understand. Like, I can invest 50 grand and I can make 100 grand and I could pay, at least on paper, it shows I'm going to have to pay 80 grand in taxes. But then I got this negative $80,000 write off from buying this property. So I can take that negative 80,000 and offset my $80,000 taxable gain and wipe it all out. So I don't, have, I don't need to pay the government. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, they're like, why is that legal? And I said, once you understand how the money system is designed in the United States, and how the IRS is designed to benefit creators, not contributors, then you realize the IRS wants you to have these tax benefits because you're a creator. You're creating wealth by moving money. And the more money you move, the more wealth you create. Therefore, eventually the IRS is going to get their piece. I mean, it's not like you're avoiding taxes forever. You're just avoiding it so you can actually grow wealth. And at some point, you're, you're, you're paying the government. It's just a matter of how and when. But I'd rather grow my wealth while I'm doing it. And at some point, Uncle Sam's going to get theirs. So they want that to happen. They want you to grow as much money as you can because they know darn well they're getting their piece down the road. So mm -hmm. that's why they benefit creators, not contributors. Contributors are W-2 employees. So if you mm -hmm. get a W-2 paycheck every week on a Friday, you are a contributor, right? So you're only gonna get minimal tax write-offs mm -hmm. because the IRS says you're not moving enough money. So if you go into being a creator, which is a business owner or an investor, if you're a business owner or you're an investor, then you get all these IRS tax benefits. That's why you get all these ba 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 because the IRS is saying, great, you're moving a ton of money, mm -hmm. therefore you get a ton of tax breaks because we want you to grow that money as fast and as rapid as you can to get to home run status because we know later down the road we're getting our pie, but we're gonna get a bigger piece. Does that make sense? That's why the IRS is doing this. It's not because they're nice. Because <laughs> it works in their favor as well. <laughs> yeah, but they're, do they're taking a short-term loss to get mm -hmm. a long-term benefit. And the IRS is yes. not dumb. The government's not like, okay, we're gonna give people free money. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. like they're giving you kind of write-offs now so you can grow mm -hmm. knowing full well, you're gonna pay us a bigger piece later, home skillet. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's why they do it. That's why they do it. And so if you're moving money in society, you get those benefits, so. Cool. We have a lot, some good people coming in here. I love it. Uh, anybody want to chime in? Glorified thieves. Lale, she's like, the IRS is glorified thieves. You're exactly right. <laughs> You're exactly right. They are uh, very tactful. Very tactful. <laughs> you know, I, listen, I don't mind paying my fair share, as they say. Uh, 
we just need to feel like it's going to, you know, not with all due respect, paying for health care of illegal immigrants. It just, it's just not okay. You know, we want it to go for our society and people that are benefiting here and not random stuff all over the place. And I think that's what people care most about is they don't mind paying taxes when they feel like, hey, it's, it's benefiting and we're paying it for the cause that we are supposed to be paying them for. So awesome. Well, yeah, we, I, I just want to do a quick little 30 minute with you and kind of get a feel for you're in the mentorship. You're in it with a small team of a few people. So if the folks want to come in, we do allow a couple people into teams to come in and not individually only. Um, and then we, I think we allow up to two, typically two, you guys got a few more, but two without having to pay more. So, but you know, that way you can kind of spread cost and, hold each other accountable. Um, the team aspect, most people have had most success coming in as teams, quite honestly, even if it's another partner person um, mm -hmm. that's in it because you're gonna hold each other self accountable in addition to us holding you accountable too, so. Yeah, thank you. No, your mentorship program has been amazing and to echo what you were saying earlier about how partnerships and how you scale it and kind of your intentions of this community that you've built. I will say that was our, I wouldn't say selling point, but that was the reason why we committed to this program. Yeah. Like you, there's so many other ones, but the way your intentions behind of really wanting to help us is showing up for us, like flying to see Hayden and Matt just a couple of weeks ago and then making time to meet with me, but you're just available to us. And I think that is the biggest differentiator between the different mentor show mentorship programs it's mm. like your face is on it but we have access to you as well so from our team thank you <laughs> yeah and and i i wanted to create something because i do appreciate in um uh, respect pace morby um and whether people like him or don't like him i don't know um but it, what he has done is create a really vibrant community specifically in creative financing in focused on single family and wholesaling and flipping and all that kind of avenue so what we've done is multifamily specific and but creating that kind of environment of great community and connection where people are doing deals together and or we can even partner on deals and stuff like that is really the design of it so that way everybody's getting rich i mean i want everybody rich everybody so it's not just hey let's go burn and turn some some courses and programs anybody can do that uh, Lola, i did have one question here before we finish up and i'll get your opinion on this it's probably harder to find investors, OPM, so other people's money, investors, uh, without a deal. Uh, how long does it take and can you move fast enough? So let me explain how you raise money. You don't raise money by just going and asking people for money, <laughs> <laughs> right? So a deal needs to lead the conversation. So you can get soft commitments from people, right? Mm -hmm. Give you a perfect example of a soft commitment. I'm in Trader Joe's a few weeks ago and I'm talking to the checkout clerk. And in that checkout clerk conversation, we're having small talk and she's asking, oh, how's your day going? I said, great, I'm just finishing up some work and phone calls and blah, blah, blah. She's like, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a multifamily investor. We buy and sell apartments around the country and we do it with investors. And she's like, oh, like that's really cool. She's like, like my brother has been talking about investing in real estate, like multifamily apartments. I mean, can I give him your information and you guys can maybe connect? And I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, obviously, of course, that's how the conversation starts. And then I had the conversation with her brother and all he did was soft commit. He's like, so you have investors, you have things, how, what's the minimum? I said, $50,000 minimum investment on most of our deals. He's like, great. He says, when you have a deal, send it my way. I'm very interested to invest alongside you. So now he went into my CRM system. He's in there. So when we have a deal, it's getting blasted to him. And that way you've created soft commitments in your system. And when you have an actual deal, the deal will drive the interest. It's like having a lure and you have lures in the water for all the fish coming. So the deal, without a deal, people like, all you're gonna do is say, well, yeah, I'll invest with you, I like you, but I don't have Sounds anything good. to invest in. So show, <laughs> yeah, show me a deal mm -hmm. and I'm very interested. Mm -hmm. So that's what drives it, 100%. So Lala, you're dead on. Um, you have to have a, a deal, a deal will drive it. So it's always deal, debt, equity deal debt equity in that order so you get the deal then you're going to get the debt which is typically the loan and then the equity is all your investors and it's going to come in that order and trust me the deal will attract the money because if the deal makes sense financially and you're not a complete moron in a fraud people will be attracted to you right they'll be attracted i mean if i came to you kiana and i said and i think i've 
mentioned this to you before. If I came to you and I said, hey, I have a 30-unit deal in Phoenix, Arizona, and it produces about 15 to 18% per year on your money, and it's a $25,000 minimum investment to get involved, who do you know that may have some interest in that? And then your response is probably going to be, well, like I have a, maybe some other people. I, I'm actually interested. Like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Like, can you share some information with mm -hmm. me? And then I'm going to be like, yeah, yeah, let me send you the pitch deck. Mm -hmm. And that's going to give you a full breakdown of the deal, what it is, how much money you're bringing in, when you get your money, how much money do you make on your money, and when you get your money back. Because that's what investors care most about is, hey, I like the deal. How much money, right? How long is it out? Mm -hmm. What's my return, projected returns? And when the heck do I get my money back? Absolutely. And if you can showcase that to people – then the money will find you and it'll, it'll chase the deal. So go get deals that make sense. And if you want to find deals that make sense, you got to get to the off market stuff. And we go into all that, obviously in the mentorship as we've done a million times. So. Can you share that one quote, um, the handshake quote? I think it is uh, a great one. Oh yeah. The, the, the more money you make, or what does it say? The more hands you shake, the more money you make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a perfect I mean, that, that is a, And that's not my quote, by the way. I wish I was smart enough to come up with it. <laughs> uh, that's from my mentor. He's like, yeah, man, the more hands you shake, the more money you make. Like, you don't need money. You need people, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the, the more people, think about it, the, the bigger your Rolodex, you're technically going to have people that maybe are qualified, not qualified, it's irrelevant. But the bigger and more elaborate your Rolodex, the more people that are going to be attracted into whatever it is you're doing in life, mm -hmm. period. <laughs> So, and you may not be a social person. That's not the point. You could be an introvert in a way, mm -hmm. but you need to have some ability to say hi to people, right? <laughs> uh, um, people say, well, I'm not very social. I said, well, look, I'm not asking you to go be socialite, you know, Miss Socialite or Mr. Socialite. What I am asking you is if you're in a room with people that mm -hmm. you don't go sit in the corner. That's all I ask. And then you don't need, you can get exhausted from a networking event. I mean, people do. I get exhausted from networking events, mm -hmm. but I know that I can go recharge at home. But when I'm there, I'm going to make the most use of getting to know people because people know people that know people. Mm -hmm. And so people tell me, I, I can't raise money. I don't know anybody. I don't know this. I, don't. I said, listen, your friends and family may be broke as a joke, 100%. But I guarantee those friends and family know people that know people that know people. And I guarantee that you have a deal that earns people 14 to 20% a year on their money. Like if you actually have a deal that produces 14 to 20% a year on their money, the money will find the deal. I guarantee it every single time. Because somebody knows somebody knows somebody that will pass it along and they'll be like, holy S-H-I-T, yeah. <laughs> like I can, you tell me I can go own a piece of this multifamily apartment building, get 14 to 20% a year on my money, where otherwise mm -hmm. I'd be getting maybe five, six, 8% in other investments out there and it's mm -hmm. medium risk it's meaning it's not low risk it's not high risk it's medium risk in a cash flowing real estate asset with mm -hmm. tax benefits up the yin yang i mean why would i not do that as long as i like and trust you and i don't think you're a fraud completely so, agree yeah that's ultimately how it all gets broken down so awesome, awesome. um yes lale you need a crm okay you need some place <laughs> to keep people <laughs> I mean, that's like, yeah. you know, you got, I don't care what it is. It could be like the basic, basic, basic CRMs. So, uh, any questions before we finish up? No, I think this has been very helpful. I appreciate your time. Cool. Awesome. Well, I thank you for coming on and kind of sharing with people your experience a little bit and how, you know, if, if someone does want to take it to the next level and kind of get into mentorship beyond just taking courses, you know, this is kind of how you do it to move the needle. So, absolutely. Absolutely. I will say this is Kiana verified. You should definitely do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time and enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Thank you, you too, Justin. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.